as much as I would like to, being as this is the first day of July, be the last service before July the 4th, which is Independence Day, not Fireworks Day. It's the celebration of the independence of this country that we love so dearly. I would like to have preached a message fitting for the occasion, but uh, the Lord rather sent me to preach one fitting for your occasion. I come to minister to every person in this place today, saint or sinner, hot or cold, even those that are lukewarm. I come today to minister into your life, where you live, where you have lived, and by the help of the Lord, where you, where you will live. Can I get an amen? Thank you for coming to the house of the Lord today. Great time of worship, beautiful songs, beautiful, beautiful songs. My prayer today was that we would open our ears and allow those songs to, to speak faith into our lives. It's in John chapter number 6 where we will go today. There's a multitude following Jesus. You don't have to put it up there yet. It'll be a while till I get there. There's a multitude following Jesus. The Bible says because they saw the miracles of those with disease being healed. Brother Pete, they're all hungry. Not hungry for Jesus. They're hungry for bologna and crackers. Maybe fish and bread. Maybe somebody's thinking about chili or stew. But they're all hungry. And there was only a lad they found who has what was for him a pretty good lunch. Five loaves of barley bread and two fish, but not so much among so many. So Jesus took it, blessed it, broke it, and with it fed 5,000 men besides the women and children. With five loaves and two fish, he fed several thousand people. That's a miracle. I said, that's a miracle. The response of the people was as they sat there, Brother McKinney, with the full belly. This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. They were believers in that moment because they had been hungry and they saw him take one little boy's meal and feed the entire crew with it. So in the evening, the disciples went out onto the sea and Jesus came to them walking on the water. He entered into the ship in the middle of a storm and they were immediately at the shore of the land to which they went. Now, it's not very far across the Sea of Galilee but in the middle of a storm, Jesus came into their boat and they were immediately on the shore. The next day, when all the people that had fed, Brother McKinney, when I read this, I'm thinking they probably looking for Jesus for breakfast. He did such a fine job at supper time that uh, we're going to try to find him. But uh, Brother Brandon, they, they got up the next morning when they went down to where Jesus was, the boats of he and the disciples were gone. Now, of course, we know Jesus didn't need a boat unless he just happened to need to take a nap. But they were all gone, and the people began to be in an uproar. The people began to ask questions, and so they gathered up some boats, and they followed him and began to search him to try to find him. And they found him, and they said, Why'd you leave us and come over here? We had a pretty good gig going where we were. 
Why did you come over here? And in John chapter 6, verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw the miracles. Now I'm going to preach just a little second right here. The first verse we find, Brother Pete, said they followed him for the miracles. But Jesus now says, you're not following me anymore for the miracles of the, those that being healed, but you're following me because of the loaves and the fish that you did eat and were filled. So this is a perfect example of what have you done for me lately? That they, they followed him because they saw miracles, but now they're following him because they were hungry and he fed them and he did it miraculously. But Jesus says, don't work, don't labor, don't search for the meat which perisheth because you were full last night, but you're hungry today. Don't look, don't look for me for that which satisfies you temporarily. Don't look for me for that which gets you out of your situation, but look for me in that meat that endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. While the next passage is rife, it's full of metaphors and allegories, it can be summarized in John chapter number six as the Lord is calling them to faith, calling them to a higher faith, a higher commitment that supersedes the things they've seen, the miracles and the things they've experienced, the food. And it will culminate. The Lord is preaching to them and he's, he's blessed them. Yes, Brother Pete, he has blessed them and yes, he has healed, but he's calling them to something that's bigger than that. And I want somebody to think right now, you've got yourself a little box that you've painted yourself in and you think in your mind, we've all been there, we've all been there, this is not accusatory, we've all been there. If God would just show up and do this for me, then I'd live for him. But Jesus was calling them to something bigger than their present circumstances. He was calling them to something bigger than just being healed of a disease because, you know, think about Lazarus just for a minute. Does somebody want to tell me about Lazarus? Uh, Lazarus uh, was brought out of the grave, but you know what happened, Brother Chris, on down the road? He tapped out again. The blind eyes were open, but you know what happened? They eventually closed again. The dumb lips were open, but they eventually closed again. The withered hand was uh, healed, but it eventually dried up again. Every miracle that the Lord performed for healing and deliverance, sick of the palsy, you name it, it was great, it was powerful, it was beautiful, but it was just for right then. He fed them, and them fish and loaves went the way of all food. The part they had they needed went to sustenance, and the part they didn't need went on down the road. He's calling them to a faith, a faith that's bigger than where they are right now. That wherever he may go and anything he might experience, that they would do it together. And whatever may befall him, they would do it together. But with the promise that what I'm going through right now is just as temporary as the miracle. Can I tell you that you're looking for a blessing but it's temporary, but your problem's temporary too. I said your problem is just as temporary. He's a God that's not limited to time or space. He's a God that's not limited to you and to your family, but he's aware of all the world. The Bible says he knows the hairs on your head. There's not a little bitty bird that falls out of the nest that the Lord doesn't know it. He's aware but Brother David, he's calling us to something bigger than that. He's calling us to something bigger than the life in which we now live. And when Jesus began to reveal himself, they murmured because they were locked in. Hear me, somebody, right now. They were locked in to knowing him as the son of Mary and Joseph. He healed the sick. He fed them. And now he's preaching to them about a commitment, Brother Brandon. And somewhere in the middle of all of that, they said, we're not interested. Now, right after their belly was full, they said, this is that prophet. He's the one. The answer's come to us. 
In verse number 63, Jesus begins to speak to them and he said, it is the spirit that quickeneth or maketh alive, resurrects. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Verse 64, but there are some of you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. And now verse 66, and I want to minister to you for a little bit. From that time, everybody say that time. Where was the miracle? The miracle was in their rear view mirror. They had no miracle. All they had was now the Lord began to call them to follow me. I want you to think of this. How did they connect with him? Does anybody remember what I just taught you? How does this verse, how does it start? They're hungry, right? He feeds them. They go to bed with a full belly. They wake up in the next morning, and guess what, Brother David? He ain't there. He's gone. So what do they do? They get in a boat, go find him. They follow him. Matter of fact, I, I don't even know if it's fair to say they follow him. They're chasing him. They're hunting him. They're looking in. They're, 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 they're actually going over some uh, humps and, and swimming some rivers, literally, to find him. But Brother McKinney, when they show up and the fishes in the loaves has dried up and nobody's getting healed and all he's saying is, uh, you need to follow me. You need to stick with me. We're going places. There's good things happening. I, I, I came down from heaven. I didn't just show up from, Mary, from Mary's womb. I came down from heaven and I've got a plan and I want you to go with me. And from that time, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. From that time, from a time of being drawn to a higher commitment and being unwilling to pay the price. Not because they weren't interested. They were interested enough to follow him to where he was. But because right at that moment, they were living in the place of feeling rather than faith. And when he began to try to promote faith, they said, we kind of like the fishes and the loaves. Their traction was physical and immediate, not spiritual and consecrated. They weren't following him because they loved him or believed in him or the power of the things he had done caused them to have great faith in tomorrow. They were following him for what he could do for them right now and do for their physical body. Not spiritual and consecrated. Now here we go. Are you ready? This is so important. You got to grasp it. I searched through the scripture. I searched through the setting, and I'm going to prove it to you in just a minute. And I cannot find anywhere where the Lord was drawing a line in the sand, Brother David. I can't find anywhere where he said, now if you don't believe what I'm preaching, you're going to have to hit the road. Understand this. These, dis these disciples in John 6 and 66 did not have to leave. They didn't have to leave. He wasn't making them leave. He wasn't forcing them to leave. He was just revealing a little bit more of himself to them. They had been walking with him. Even with a lacking in their faith, they were drawn to and or attracted to him. And when he began to lay out a, a, a step up, a step up in a commitment, they quit. They quit. They quit rather than being honest. Rather than being honest and saying,
See where I'm going, brother? Rather than being honest, rather than being open and honest with him and saying, I'm not sure I'm ready for that. And I'm not real sure I understand everything you're trying to teach me. But if, but if it's all right with you, if it's all right with you, I'm going to stay around anyway. I don't understand everything that you just taught me in about 40 verses. I don't understand everything that you're saying. I don't understand everything you're calling to. But I promise you this, I ain't never found nobody take care of me like you can. I never found nobody that can minister to me like you can. I ain't never found nobody that was there for me when you were. So even, hey, even though I'm not locked in, even though I don't understand everything, even though I'm not sure I even want to, if you'll have me, I believe I'll stay. You see, that's a lie that the devil, that's a lie that the devil sells to you. Well, if you won't do that, the Lord don't want you. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, Paul got it, nor height nor depth nor angels nor principalities nor any other creature can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. He never said go away. As a matter of fact, in verse number six of John chapter number six, I believe he said, if there's anybody comes to me, I will in no wise cast him out. Why do you think it is that when Jesus came, he didn't go to church? He went to eat with the publicans and he went to eat with the sinners and the whores and tramps were comfortable coming to him. But these people... These people said, I guess we got to go. I wish there was somebody would realize. Somebody would realize, yes, you don't understand it all. Surprise, 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 I don't either. There are things that happen. There are things that he reveals to me. I prayed today, Brother Pete. God, now you've showed this to me. Now give me the sense to share it because I ain't got it. But you know what, Sister Janice? I know I ain't going to find it nowhere else. I'm not going to find it anywhere else. They just needed to be honest. It was a perfect time, a perfect time for them to say, Jesus, we believe, but help our unbelief. How in the world, how in the world will you let the devil tell you that you're going to find what you're looking for somewhere else? He'll make you think the Lord don't want you. He'll make you think the Lord don't love you. But you know that's a lie. If you were here last Sunday, you know that's a lie. He loved you so much he died for you. It was a perfect time. Why did they leave? Just because they weren't ready right then didn't mean they weren't going to be ready down the road. And where better? Brother David, think about it just for a minute. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Where better to have your faith grow than in the presence of the Lord? Man, I could go nuts about right now. And if I had like six amens all at once, I probably would, but I'm scared I, that y'all think I've lost my mind. I realize something, folks. Realize something. There's a mentality. I, I don't really want to, Brother Brandon, but the next time, the next time somebody tells me I really want to come to church and, and I really want to be a part of that and I really want to feel the Spirit, but I don't know if I'm ready for this and I don't know if I'm ready for this, so I'm just not going to come because I'd rather stay home and be a, than be a hypocrite. What in the world? How stupid could somebody think? That's what the devil has sold us. That's what the devil has done to us. You're not a hypocrite. You're honest. When you come into the presence of the Lord and say, I messed up and I don't know how I'm thinking and I don't know where I'm going, but I know I'm going to find it right here. I know that in your presence is where it's going to happen at. 
You don't have to come into the presence of the Lord fixed. You come into the presence of the Lord to get fixed. And you stay there till you get fixed. And so we go to heaven together. Somebody ought to be excited out of their mind right now. Apparently, there was a mass exodus when he began to speak of things of faith. Let me tell you something, Sister Callie. We can sing that song, and because we know it, but even when I don't see it, he's working. Even when I don't feel it, it's working. Sometimes that ain't easy to sing because I need him to move, and I need him to move right now. It doesn't matter that he fed me yesterday. It doesn't matter that he healed me the day before that. I need him today. Guess what? He promised I'll never leave you nor forsake you. As long as there was hope of a full belly, the things that affect the flesh and the here and now, such as physical healings, not only did they stay, but they were willing to hunt him down. They were willing to put out the extra effort. They were willing to go the extra mile as long as there was something in it for them. But when he started talking about faith, he lost me there, buddy. You lost me there. When it came to a matter of spiritual things, they were no longer interested and left to pursue other avenues of finding a feel-good experience. You see, hell... Hell magnifies our doubts and fears, our failures and our scars, and our fear of failing, and our fear of losing. Hell magnifies it. Verse 67, then Jesus asked his disciples, then Jesus said unto the twelve, will you also go away? Now apparently his, his question was genuine. Albeit it had a surface purpose, but it had a deeper purpose. One rooted in physical security and affirmation that is necessary for spiritual growth and sustenance. In order to want something, you've got to hunger for it. And if the Lord keeps filling you and filling you and filling you, when are you ever going to be hungry? So many times, Sister Stephanie, if I can use the carnal analogy, sometimes we say, I think I'll just stay right here and eat. But when the table dries up, we think he's abandoned us when in fact, when in fact he's calling us to a new table. New place. Jesus, of course, knowing all things, he knew their hearts, but he also knew that his disciples needed to establish it within themselves. And then verse 68, and now this is kind of cool, okay? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And then 69, but you don't have to go there just yet. And then we believe, he said, and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Now I want you to know it's very important right now that Peter does not make this declaration based upon what he has heard. But he's basing it upon what he believes he will hear. The disciples are saying, we know what we found. We've heard the words of eternal life. We recognize the revelation of the heavenly becoming earthly. And that is an essentiality for anybody that plans on enduring until the end. But I asked the guys at breakfast this morning, and I'm asking you right now, what, what did Peter and the disciples really know? Not much. Not much. As a matter of fact, when they started the process of killing Jesus, what did the disciples do? Split. They did the same thing that this crew did. 
Now, of course, it's a little bit different. They left because there wasn't any groceries. The disciples left because they didn't know what to do. Jesus is getting killed. He looks like he's losing. He ain't never lost before. But in Luke chapter number 24, which you're going to be ministering to you about soon, the Bible says he sat down to eat with them and he opened up their understanding to the scriptures. The disciples really didn't know much. But Peter said, we know you've got the words of eternal life. Peter didn't say, hey, we know you put out a pretty good spread. Peter didn't say, I know that you healed a lot of people. Peter said, I know down the road. I know that down the road you've got something for us. So we're going to stay here till we get it. It wasn't the miracle signs and wonders. It wasn't the food nor the water. But Peter and the disciples were saying, this is it. It is not without its pratfalls and uncertainties. It is not without its questions and out its fears. And, and it is not without its sleepless nights. And it's not without sometimes, as Job said, looking around, where's he at? It's not as though we've uncovered everything there is to know about both here and in the future for us as individuals and for the body of Christ. But I am convinced. I am as convinced as I've ever been that everything I don't know, everything that I don't have, everything that, I, that he has for me, this is where I'm going to find it. I said this is where I'm going to find it. We might have questions and we might fail. We might fall out and we may not always succeed, but we aren't going anywhere. If I'm going to be wounded, if I'm going to be hurt, if I'm going to be weak, and if I'm going to be lonely, I'm going to do it in the presence of the Lord. If I'm going to stutter and stammer, and if I'm not going to be sure, and if I'm going to be uncertain, and if I'm going to sometimes be frustrated, I'm going to do it in the presence of the Lord. Because here there's a, here there's a divine connection that's pulling me and convicting me in the middle of all the turmoil of life, in the middle of all of my questions, in the middle of all of my struggles, in the when I wake up and spiritually my eyes are black and my nose is bleeding and my lips are all poked out and I don't even feel like I can pray. I know he's doing a work in my life and he is perfecting me and he is completing me. I come to tell somebody today, I'm not going anywhere. In the Old Testament, First Samuel, you don't have to, you don't have to go there. I'm going to be quick. First Samuel chapter 17, one of the most famous in all the Bible. Forty days in a row, morning and night, a nine-plus tall giant comes out and defies the armies of the living God. A little boy named David shows up. He's only the grocery delivery boy. He's not a warrior. He's not a soldier. He's just a lowly shepherd boy. He brings some cheese. And he brings some meat. And he brings some gifts. And he comes to get the news. And about the time David walks out there, the big old boy comes out and holler, give me a man. I'll fight him. And if he beats me, we'll serve you. And if I beat him, you'll serve us. And David said, not today, buddy. Not today. Now, I can dress that up and I can call it anything I want, but you got a nine and a half foot tall man. And I've told you all before, that's just about how high those chandeliers are. And I'm six foot three and... From the things I've saw Saul was about my height, Brother David, somewhere around there. The average man about five foot five, five foot six. David's a little squirt. David's a little filly. He's just a lad. He's, he's so uh, inconsequential to look at that, that uh, the king said, no way, buddy. Sorry. You're just a pup. But David goes out. You cannot tell me. I want you to hear me this morning. Any of us. Any of us, you cannot tell me that he wasn't shaking in his shoes. When he showed up, 
the first thing he did, he gets out of the chariot and Eliab said, what in the world are you doing here? You prideful, naughty little boy. It's in the book. I guess you came to watch the fight. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? And then he goes, he tells him, hey, I'll fight him. I'll fight him. I'll take that giant out. He goes to Saul. Saul said, no way. When he finally convinced him, Brother Pete, he said, the only way you can do it is put my armor on. You got to go fight him like a soldier. David put that armor on. I remember in Sister Barker's class, we had some little, them little felt things that showed David with that armor on and come down across his nose because, you know, that would be like uh, my wife trying to wear something of mine. It's a similar type deal. And David took it off said, I can't wear that because I haven't proved it. You talk about David showed up to feed him. He showed up to hear the news and take it back to daddy. As soon as he gets out of, the, out of his chariot, they start beating him up, running him down. The whole time, he's the only man in the whole country of Israel that even said, hey, I'll do it. And everybody belittles him. Everybody knocks him down. Everybody talks about him. Everybody ridicules him. It's just like a constant bombardment. You think, what's the deal, man? What's the deal? Place of no understanding, a place of failure, uh, men magnified. Uh, I mean, and don't nobody want to be on David's side. He stands alone, right? He never stood alone for one second. Because it wasn't what was before him that took him to the giant. But it was what was behind him. Because he said, I was tending my daddy's sheep. And a bear rose up and took one of them. I chased him down and I took that lamb out of his mouth. And then he rose up against me and I slew him. Same thing happened with a lion. I'm not going out there. You talk about not understanding. You talk, talk about being in a place where and nobody would blame him. Just quit, David. Just go home. Nobody appreciates you here. Nobody loves you here. Nobody cares about what you're doing. But it didn't take David long to realize he wasn't there because Jesse sent him. He was there because God sent him. And the rest of the story, you know, he went out. The giant even began to make fun of him and laugh at him. And I think about David as he runs to meet the giant thinking, you're right, buddy, I am littler than you. You're right, buddy, I am scared. You're right, buddy, I got no business out here. I don't even own a sword. Matter of fact, when I take you out, I'm going to have to borrow yours, cut your head off. I ain't got nothing but a sling. But I've got the knowledge that you're coming with a spear and a sword, but I'm coming to you, not with a sling, but I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Uh, what would happen if you would get up in the morning in the middle of your trial, in the middle of your mess, uh, and you would begin to speak faith, uh, not what you feel, not what's going on inside of you, not what's going on in your mind, but you would look at that giant and say, uh, I'm not coming within me, uh, I'm not coming in myself, uh, but I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Uh, and the Bible said he put the stone in there, he let it fly, hit the old boy in the head, he fell down stone and the Goliath came and cut his head off. David came and cut his head off. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They've been elevated. They came in as slaves and they've been elevated. It seemed like everything was going good and then all of a sudden they have their legs knocked out from underneath them. Nebuchadnezzar builds an image and he puts all these musicians together and he says, uh, when they play the songs, everybody got to bow down. So they played the songs and everybody bowed down except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Facing opposition, facing enemies, facing certain destruction and they're in a no-win situation. Understand, though, it looked like the Lord brought us out of, of uh, 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 Israel and brought us into Babylonian captivity and then he blessed us a whole lot and now he's going to let us be taken out. Nobody stands with us. Here we are, three Hebrew children in a strange country, in a strange land on our own. Here's our choices, bow or burn. But we're not bowing. 
And what's the matter, we don't even have to think about it long, King Nebuchadnezzar. Because we know that God is able. But here's the truth of the matter. Somebody hear me right now. We don't like to think about this because winning is the only thing on our mind. But the three Hebrew children were understanding something. That if they went through the furnace and this body was burnt, they were delivered. They said it doesn't matter if he delivers us or not. The truth of the matter is we didn't bow. Because God is with us and he's able. And we are here to stay. Woman at the well, she shows up at noontime. We talk a lot about why that might have been. Very strong evidence that she showed up at noontime because all the respectable women didn't want to draw water at the same time as her. She shows up at the well just in time to meet Jesus. You know, if you don't know the story, I'll share it with you real quickly. Jesus is hot, tired, dusty, and thirsty. The disciples are going to the grocery store to get some food. This lady comes up with a pot, and then there's a well, and there's a hook. She can let it down. The Lord said, hey, sister, won't you give a brother a drink? She says, hey, I know you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan. We got no business talking to one another. And Jesus said immediately, boom, hey, Toots, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for a drink, not me asking you for one. I have water to drink that you'll never thirst again. The Lord's looking for true worshipers. And there's, a, there's a bunch of beautiful things in there. And she, the Lord tells her, hey, hon, go get your husband. And she said, not married. And the Lord said, it's, it's a different society than what we live in. Just the fact that she had had five previous husbands and was shacking up with a, with a man that wasn't her husband was enough for her to be completely ostracized. And in some circles, Brother David killed. She said, I don't have a husband. And the Lord said, that's a fact. But you've been married five times. And the one you're living with now, he's not your husband. She left her water pot at the well. And the Bible says she made her way into the city and everybody she saw, she said, come see a man. She said, come see a man. Can I minister to you for just a minute? She said, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. Now, we know, Garrison, we know that her and the Lord ain't never met. They're strangers. So, Brother David, it's a miracle that the Lord knew all of her life. And it appears on the surface that the reason why she went running is because the Lord knew all my past. He told me, he, he just told me everything that I knew, but that's not the reason she went. It's because he was a Jew who should hate a Samaritan, hate the best Samaritan. But the beautiful thing was that he found out about her past and stayed with her anyway. Somebody needs to hear the word of the Lord right now. I didn't even have this in my notes. The Lord whooped it on me while I was sitting over here a while ago. She went and said, come see a man that told me everything I did. It wasn't that he knew all her business. It was that he knew all her business and he stopped there to visit her anyway. It was that he knew her past, but he wanted to visit with her. He told his disciples, we got to go through Samaria. It wasn't because he needed a drink at the well. It was because that woman had an appointment with him. And she recognized that. You think she understood? Sister Janice, she was already telling him we believe two different things. She told him that. Did you, you read in the Bible? You say in Jerusalem we ought to worship, and we say here in Samaria you ought to worship. We believe two different things. You know something, Brother Chris? It wasn't about what they believed. 
It was about she had come in contact with Jesus. And she did not understand at all everything he had to offer her. She certainly didn't understand everything that he told her. But she said, I'm going to stay here anyway. Because I'm going to stay here anyway. John chapter number 7. The officers are sent by the Pharisees to apprehend Jesus. They come to apprehend him. They, the soldiers came to get him, and he began to minister. He began to talk. He began to preach. And when they heard him, the soldiers said, Never man spake like this man. They didn't know it all. They didn't understand all that they knew. They didn't all agree. They weren't from the same place. They weren't from the same background. They didn't all have the same needs, the same desires, the same feelings, etc. But they knew something was different about Jesus. But they all knew, I said, but they all knew that in Jesus Christ, they had hope. Everybody say hope. Come on, say it again. Oh, what a beautiful word. Oh, what a beautiful word. They all knew that in Jesus Christ, they had hope. Listen, Jesus, and I, I've alluded to this earlier but Jesus could have kept on feeding. He could have kept on healing. And you know how long they would have let him do it? As long as he would. Do you know how long he would have done it if they would have stayed with him? As long as they needed it. In their weakness, in their shallowness, in their lack of faith and in their lack of knowledge. They just needed to stay. I was thinking in my mind, I'm not going to talk about it because I'm fixing to move forward. But the Bible says in Luke, it's 15th chapter, that the prodigal came to himself in the hog pen. It would appear to me that he lost himself in the house. It was that that drove him away from the house. He should have realized, Brother David, I, I don't know if I'm in this for the long haul. I, I really don't know if I appreciate this or not, but you know what he needed to leave? All of his substance. He didn't have to leave, Brother David. He didn't have to leave. I come to tell somebody today, it's here you need to stay. It's in the presence of the Lord you need to stay. Say, well, I, I don't know about this and I don't know about that. Join the crowd. The Lord is revealing things to me almost on a daily basis right now. Some of them will curl your toes. Paul said, I told the guys again, Paul said, I'm instructed in all things to be both full and hungry. Hebrews chapter 6, and I'm coming to a close. You can come to the music. That by two, everybody say two, immutable things. That word immutable, anybody want to tell me what that means? Unchangeable, unaffectable, solid, set in stone forever and ever. No mutations are available to them. They are what they are from the beginning until now in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope. Everybody say hope set before us. Two things, two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Two immutable, unchangeable, unshakable things. The first immutable thing is he made a promise to Abraham. He said, you're going to have, I want somebody to hear me right now. What was the promise he made to Abraham? You're going to have a son. Even though you're old dried up and even though your wife has passed the childbearing, she done went through the change. 
and won the crown. But it's coming back on her. And she's going to have a son. And your seed, even though you don't right now, you're going to have a son, and your seed is going to be as the stars of the heaven and as the sand of the sea. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The first immutable thing, oh, somebody hear me right now. The first unchangeable, immutable thing is God made a promise to Abraham, Brother Manning. And guess what? I'm almost done. Brother Trey, he said, you're going to have a crew coming after you. You don't have no babies right now, but you're going to have one. And he is going to be through you and your seed that Jesus Christ is coming into the earth. And you're going to have a seed. You're going to have as many kids as there are stars in the heaven and as many kids as there is grains of sand on the seashore. So what's the first immutable thing that God cannot lie? Who do you think he's talking to? Huh? Who do you think he's talking to? The first immutable thing, the first unchangeable thing, the first unimpeachable thing is God made a promise to Abraham and you're it. Oh, come on now. He can't lie. Because he promised Abraham there was a seed coming. And guess what? Let me tell you something, honey. If the Lord wasn't going to bring his promise to pass in your life, he would have let you die when you was out there in the gutter somewhere. The Lord brought you here because he's got a plan for you. If he didn't have a purpose for your life, you wouldn't be here. But you know his promises are true because you're still standing. I said, you know his promises are true that he does not lie because you're still standing. And the second thing is, when he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Abraham, <laughs> you're going to have a seed. There there and here you are and the second thing is that in thy seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed when he could swear by no greater <laughs> he swore by himself I said when he could swear by no greater he swore by himself say what's the other immutable thing there were shepherds on a hillside nearby keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, there appeared unto them a great host of angels singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. You know what they said to the shepherds? They said, don't be afraid. You know why? For unto you is born this day in the city of David. When he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. You see, there's two immutable things. One is, God made a promise, I'm going to have a people. And he made a promise, I'm going to make a way for those people because I can't make a promise by any greater, I'm going to make a promise by myself. And the word was in the beginning with God and the word was God and the word was made flesh and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Let me tell you something, honey, you're feeling the other immutable thing that God cannot lie. God cannot lie. He's kept his word to us. We're here and he's here. We're here and he's here. Somebody ought to show out. So I'm looking for a healing. I'm looking for groceries. You ain't going to find it nowhere but here. Which hope we have. Stand with me. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. both sure and steadfast. 
which entereth into that what's in the veil. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Which hope, which hope, which hope. To the Hebrews, the veil symboled a dividing line. It symboled entrance into a place nobody else could ever go into. It symboled, symbolized a meeting place between the Shekinah glory of God at the mercy seat. It was an ultimate for them. It was the sacred, the fearful, the most holy place. Brother David, as I journey my way into the presence of the Lord, it is the hope he's given me that keeps me anchored there. It is the hope he gives me that keeps me anchored there. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I'm making my way into the presence of the Lord. Not the outer court, not the inner court, but the most holy place into the presence of the Lord. And you know what? I'm coming flawed and I'm coming weak and I'm coming bruised and I'm coming battered, but I'm coming. I'm staying anchored to this hope. I'm staying anchored to this hope that I have. It's an anchor of my soul. It's an anchor of my soul. And I hold on to what I know about him. I hold on what's true about him because of two things. Two things. I'm here and he's here. I'm here and he's here. And I'm not leaving. And he promised not to leave me. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but I'll go with you all the way. And John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I turned around and and behold, there sat one on the throne, and it was the Lamb for sinners slain. Somebody needs to hear right now that Jesus is alive and well, and you're alive and well, and you've come together today, and I come to preach hope to you. Which will bring you into his presence. Hope, hope, hope. It's not the groceries and it's not the healing. It was only those that brought them to him, Brother David. But he wanted to put something in them. Peter did not understand. He did not understand what he even said. We can't go anywhere else. Somebody needs to make up in their mind, I'm here to stay. I'm weak, but his strength is made perfect in my weakness. I'm low, but he's the rock that's higher than I. I've sinned, but he's an advocate whose blood washes me whiter than snow. I don't understand everything, but he hath revealed that stuff to us by his spirit. Questions? Yep, I still sure do. Do I wonder why people do good and still struggle? Yes. Do I sometimes lay my head on my steering wheel or sometimes lay my head against the wall or sometimes fall before the Lord and say, Lord, I don't have anything to tell them. I, I don't have anything to tell them. I, I don't have an answer. Brother Manning, that's when we just keep believing. Because the only hope I have, the only hope I have is in him. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm, come on, help me. I'm here to stay. I don't have it all together. I don't understand it all. Brother David, sometimes it's not fair. If it's ever going to make sense, it's going to be here. If it's ever going to make sense, it's going to be here. Sometimes, Sister Janice, all I have holding me is my faith. 
all I have. Sometimes I don't feel good. Sometimes, I'm talking spiritually. Uh, Sister Nanny, sometimes I, I don't feel the presence of the Lord. I don't always feel goosebumps. Matter of fact, sometimes I feel more hell than heaven. But you know what? I'm going to stay here because I know the one that conquered hell. Huh? I said, I know the one that went to hell and came back with the keys. And the book said he took captivity captive. So here we are. Here we are, just as we are. Just as we are. I heard somebody say it a long time ago. I heard it again. He will take you just like you are. Don't nobody think you got to change to come to Jesus. He'll take you just like you are, but you know what? He loves you way too much to leave you there. They sang it first song. I didn't even share with them my stuff, and I'm really sorry about that because I tell these guys to do it, and then I struggle with it. I'm really sorry about that. But that first song, everything changes. It was like, oh, my goodness. Everything changes when your kingdom comes. Hallelujah.